So uh, two quick notes. As usual, um, the text of this talk will go up on that blog after the talk, so you don't need to take notes, and there will be links to the sources and everything. And secondly, I've got to apologize for reading the talk, because I'm getting to an age where my mind tends to wander, and I want to stay on track, because we don't have much time. Um, so, however much we would all like to be environmentally responsible in our digital preservation activities, uh, it's an unfortunate fact that, re <laughs> that reducing our energy demand isn't the biggest problem we face. As the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Sustainable Digital Preservation and Access pointed out three years ago, to no one's surprise, the big problem is economic. <clears throat> no one has the money to preserve even the stuff they think is a high priority. The only way that funds for preservation can be justified is by commitment to provide access. So the research into the historical costs of digital preservation can be summarized by this rule of thumb. Ingest takes about a half, preservation mainly storage takes about a third, and access about one-sixth of the total. How much of the storage cost does power represent? So let's take a Seagate four terabyte drive which has a retail price of $170 and a typical operating power draw of seven and a half watts. And the current power to utilities small business rate, which is about a 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, assuming it was operating for the whole of a four year service life, the disk power would cost about $35. Backblaze uses 45 similar but more expensive Hitachi drives to build its storage pod 3.0 which has dual redundant 760 watt power supplies. Assuming that the pod can survive a power supply failure with all the drives operating, the drives would take 337 watts and the rest of the system 422 watts, or a total of about two and a quarter times the disk power alone. So the drive share of the total system build cost is uh, $213 odd. With its share of the system power, the drive would use over four years uh, almost $79 worth of power, or 27% of the total four-year cost. So as you can see, power is a significant cost of preservation, but even if disk is the only medium you're using, it's probably only about 10% 10, 10 of the total. It's about one-third as important as the cost of the disk medium. So uh, eventually, power is going to become a priority. Crider's law, the exponential increase in disk density, used to mean that you could grow your collection 40% a year at approximately constant power. About three years ago, it became clear that Crider's law was slowing. Now even the industry's optimistic projections are for no more than 20%. Many archives grow more than 20% a year. The more they do, the more their power costs will increase. So although demands for computation during ingest can be high, they're over quickly and don't contribute much to the energy demand of long-term preservation. And we have a very low energy way to store data. We write it to durable offline media and put them in a salt mine. But this doesn't provide usable access and it raises awkward preservation issues about media obsolescence and integrity verification. Well, we can get a little bit of access by putting the off offline media in robots, which is actually a lot less safe than a salt mine. <laughs> but the, the robot infrastructure uses energy all the time, and the exponential increase in storage media density means that we don't keep the media for their theoretical life, but migrate, using energy, uh, to newer media when they're no longer dense enough to justify their slot in the robot. But increasingly, as the first talk today pointed out, the access scholars want is keyword search and other forms of data mining. Robots full of offline media can't support this. So a recent paper on uh, characteristics of low carbon data centers shows that the key to reducing power consumption is to use the servers efficiently, assigning and migrating tasks to keep the power up servers fully utilized and keep as many as possible powered down. While it's easy to migrate tasks among servers to keep only a fraction of them powered up, this just isn't practical for storage. Um, even before the demand for search and data mining, research 
showed that there were very few hotspots in the access patterns to preserve data. Search and data mining will spread access fairly evenly across the entire collection. This is likely to raise both the proportion of cost attributable to access, more than a sixth, and the proportion attributable to power. Uh, so, to satisfy the demands of scholars, at least one copy of your preserved data has to be on disk or some other medium with equivalent access latency and bandwidth. Can we design a storage medium that provides rapid yet energy efficient access together with very low energy usage through time? So in 2009, a team from CMU showed that a fabric consisting of a large, very large number of very low power CPUs, each with a fairly small amount of flash memory, could answer key value queries at the same speed as conventional servers using two orders of magnitude less energy per query. They called their architecture form, fast array of wimpy nodes. <laughs> it worked well because the key value problem parallelizes as well and because the I.O. performance of the wimpy CPU and the flash memory was actually much better than disk. So in 2011, Ian Adams, Ethan Miller and I showed that if the life cycle costs were properly accounted for, a similar approach would be cost competitive with disk for long-term storage, despite the much higher initial cost of disk. It would provide ac rapid access with a much lower energy demand. We called our architecture Dawn, durable array of wimpy nodes. It worked well because of a series of synergistic effects that greatly reduced power consumption and led to a much longer media service life. Unfortunately, there's an important caveat namely, if life cycle costs were properly accounted for. The much higher capital costs of Dawn are balanced by much lower running costs over a much longer media service life than disk systems like Backblazes. I don't know any institution operating a digital archive that has a planning horizon long enough to make that trade-off. Most operate on an annual budget cycle. Large savings in, say, years four through 10 are ignored. Now, Amazon, a company that's notorious for not caring about making profit, does have a long enough planning horizon. It's one of the reasons that they dominate the market for web services and especially storage. So, because your short-termism means that you aren't going to buy the initially more expensive, but in the longer term, cheaper dawn systems, vendors aren't going to make them. They have their own version of short-termism. They're very happy to sell you a product with a limited service life. Doing so is called planned obsolescence and has a long history. In the storage world, it's driven by Crider's law. In 2009, I blogged about Dave Anderson's description of Seagate's investigation of the idea of a disk drive specifically for archival use. Technologically, it was easy. You could build a very reliable, very long-lived drive, but there was no way to make money building it. One reason was that customers wouldn't buy it. The economics for them of replacing older drives with newer ones that were identical in all respects except for greater capacity are irresistible. The other reason was that even if customers did want to buy these drives, there would be a niche product sold in small volumes, so they would cost a lot more per byte than the consumer drives. Customers are, with good reason, skeptical of manufacturers' claims for reliability. Thus, even if the special archival disks actually did repay the additional cost in greater reliability, it would likely not be possible to persuade the customers of this. Of course, as Crider's Law slows down, it makes sense to keep the drives for longer, but it slows down slowly, never providing at any one given time a big enough motivation to invest the extra upfront to get the lower running costs out to the planning horizon. So the pessimistic conclusion is the bulk of preserved data is going to be on hard disk, burning more power than it should for a good long time. Economics means that even the dramatic technological change, even if it can reduce power consumption by orders of magnitude, isn't viable in the marketplace. This is both because power isn't yet a big part of the total cost of preservation and because institutions systematically discount the impact of future costs. Nevertheless, there are things that you can do while we wait for the dramatic technological change that can reduce your power consumption. They won't make a big difference, but every little helps. And this is where I hand on to the people who are trying to do that. Can you hear me? Escape, I know that. 
Hello? Can you hear me now?